All right, hello everyone, and welcome to ELF University here for the second KringleCon. My name is Mark Baggett, and it is my distinct pleasure to be here to um, present to you logs where we're going, we don't need logs. So first, thank you to Santa Claus for having me back. This is such a wonderful event. And how about this new venue? This, is this amazing or what? So a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Mark Baggett. I do penetration testing and incident consulting on the side when I'm not teaching for SANS or working uh, for the Department of Defense on a contract uh, to help our military, uh, the US military get develop their cyber uh, capabilities. I'm also the author of SANS SEC 573, which is automating information security with Python. You know, we talk to the leadership in the information security industry. Oftentimes you'll hear them talk about the three pivotal skills that every information security professional wants. And this is always being a systems administrator of Linux and Windows and knowing how to control those operating systems knowing networking and how to, uh, to interface with networks and set up networks and monitor networks. And that third most pivotal skill is the ability to build tools. And SEC 573 is focused on giving you those skills. So enough about that. Let's talk about what happens every time I show up at a customer's site uh, when we're doing incident response. You, you show up there, you talk to the customer, and you say, all right, I understand you've been compromised. Let me take a look at your claw, at your logs. And inevitably, the customer's response is always less than satisfactory, right? If they even have logs to begin with, when you get into the logs, you start looking and it's not recording the artifacts that you need in order to really understand what's going on with this incident. And right? I've, I've had incidents where I've shown up and the customer has no logs whatsoever to record the connections coming in and out of the organization. They're not recording the log on failures on their systems. And certainly they're not giving, getting to the level of detail that we'd really like in incident management where they're recording the processes that are running on the hosts, who's running those processes and things like that. So what do you do in that situation where you've shown up, you, the, you know that they've been compromised, but there's just no logs in place for you to really understand what's going on. Well, what if we could go back in time 30 days and from that point in time, start recording every process that ran on every computer inside the organization? What if you could go back in time and capture all of the network profiles that were used? So if they were on the wired network, it would tell you if they were on a wireless network, it would record the name of the wireless network. It would record those network connections and how much data transferred across them. What if you could go back in time and record the SSID, the user, the user unique security identifier, the SID, um, that's associated with every user that ran any process on that computer? What if you had a log time machine? What we really need, we need Doc Brown to come to the rescue. We need him to be able to take us back in time by 30 days so that we can go and enable logging in these hosts. Well, where we're going, we don't need logs because we do have a log time machine that is now built into the Windows operating system and we just need the ability to access that data. So with Doc Brown, you see his, his control panel over there on the left. Doc Brown always traveled in increments of 30 years, but his time machine required 1.21 gigawatts in order to travel back in time and activate that flux capacitor. On our Windows systems, we have a similar time machine and it shows up on your task manager. So when you do that control, alt look at that task manager, you've got that application history tab. And on that application history tab, if you look at the top of it, you'll see resource usage since, and this is always 30 days in the past of your current date and time. So, the task manager is maintaining a database where it keeps some statistics about the applications that have run on your host. Unfortunately, when you look at this thing in the task manager app history, it's very underwhelming, right? The, the statistics that I see there, well, one, it, it's only showing me the Metro apps that I've got on my Windows system, right? I, who, who uses these applications? 
I, I don't see any of the applications I use. And two, the information that's there, well, it's, it's not very helpful to me in an incident response. But the great news is that the database that is in use by the application history tab contains lots of detailed information that is very useful to us. We just need the ability to get to it. So I'm gonna to introduce to you two tools today that will let you get to that information and pull that information out. So during your next incident, when no logs are available, you can go back and capture all of this information across every device in your network. The first one is Srum Dump. Srum Dump, when I wrote Srum Dump, it is intended for ease of use. It's got a nice graphical user interface. You select the database, it'll automatically extract the database, which is locked by the operating system. Make a copy of that, make a copy of your registry, and then it will analyze the database and export all of the logs to an Excel spreadsheet with multiple tabs. So you'll have a tab for each of the different tables that are inside of that SRUM database. SRUM standing for Systems Resource Utilization Management Database. This tool is available on my GitHub. I'll show, show it to you in just a second. The other tool I want to introduce to you is ESE to CSV. And it's the command line version of SRUM dump, and it's intended for mass collection, right? I, I can't use this graphical user interface and reach out to each computer in my network, but ESE to CSV, I can run it through PS exec or some other type of process execution on every host in my network, and it will dump that SRUM into CSV files. I can choose to dump a single file or all of the tables that we have in the SRUM. ESE to CSV isn't limited to just the SRUM database. It can dump any database that's in an ESE format. And you've got lots of those on your Windows system, including the Edge browser history and other things. And ESE to CSV works on a plugin extendable architecture where uh, it, you can have it dump generic ESE databases and not do any analysis on them, or you can provide these plugins where it will supplement the data that it gets out of the database with additional information from Windows registry, from online resources and things like that. So let's just take a quick look at these two tools. Srum Dump, as I mentioned, is that ease of use tool. It's got a nice graphical user interface, as you can see here on the left. Um, if you run Srum Dump as an administrator, then it'll be able to acquire the locked files that are on your operating system. If you're not going to run it as an administrator, then you need to be using a a forensics image of a hard drive where the srudb.dat file is not locked by the operating system. But of course, in an instant response, the easiest thing to do would be to right click on SRUM dump, run it as an administrator, and then let it execute. Now, optionally, you've got this software hive. If you provide it with a software hive, it's going to use that software hive to look up the names of user accounts. So those user SIDs, it's going to look those up and the names of network profiles that were used on the system. And finally, it dumps everything to a big spreadsheet. Let's take a quick look at SRUM dump and what that looks like. So here I've got a copy of it. Um, first of all, I download this from my GitHub. So github.com, Mark Baggett, SRUM dump. I can just click here, download a zip file. The only two files that I really need are SRUM dump.exe, um, or in this case, SRUM dump2.exe, and this template. The template tells it what kind of files to extract and other information. Looking at the template here, you can see that it's got lots of information in it, including uh, the names of the types of interfaces, SIDs. So if you want to take the, the SSIDs that are known and associated with your organization and plug those into this database, then it'll automatically look up when it sees a particular SID, it'll tie a user account to it. So here we've got the names of the well-known SIDs that are associated with uh, the Windows operating system. Okay. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna run SRUM dump two, Oops, I'm gonna cancel that. I'm gonna right click on it and run it as an administrator. And it pops up and takes a second to get going, fire up this graphical user interface, and it asks me to select the path to the DAT. So I can just browse out to C colon backslash Windows System 32 SRU directory. And here I see SRU DB dot DAT. I'm gonna select that. It recognizes that that is the one that's locked by the operating system and um, tells me that I can either download fget and man manually extract it, or I can click auto extract. When I click auto extract here, you can see in the command line, it's using the built-in utility ESENTUtil to extract a copy of that. And it's extracting a copy of my software registry hive. And then it fills in these fields with those values, the path to those temporary copies of that. But I can click okay. 
and then it begins analyzing those files and dumping all of the records out of those files. So while that's running in the background, let me go ahead and go to my pre-baked cake over here where I've got an Excel spreadsheet from a previous run of Strum Dump and show you the kind of things that we can get out of here. So uh, you see multiple tabs here across the bottom. I've got an application resource tab, a network usage. I'm gonna guess that it's very difficult for you to see this. So I'm gonna zoom in on here so we can take a look at some of these fields in a little bit more detail. So we've got a strum ID number. This is just an internal number of that record. I've got the date and time where this application was running. I got the name of the application that ran. I've got the user SID that ran this application, the amount of time it had in the foreground and background. So during an incident, I can go back here. I can see this is on uh, September 10th from September 10th. Let's go all the way to the bottom of my spreadsheet here. September 10th, look at all of this detail. I'm still looking at September 10th, September, September 10th, September 10th. And let's just scroll to the bottom of the spreadsheet here. Go all the way to the bottom slide bar up to 11.9. So I've got an entire month's worth of data and I can see the names of every process that ran, the name of the user that ran that process and the amount of time it had in the foreground and background. On my network usage tab, very similarly, let's zoom in a bit here so we can see the stuff a little better. I have the date and time, the application that ran and these are just the network, the applications that used the network. So here I can see on uh, September 10th, I had Excel.exe running on my system, and this was run under by the account Mark Baggett. I can see the type of interface it ran, the name of the, the wireless network that it was connected to when it transferred this data. I can also see the amount of information that was sent and the amount of information that was received. So I know the names of the users that were on these systems. I know the names of the processes that were run. I know which networks they were connected to and which, uh, how much data they transferred across those networks. And I can retrieve all of this for every process that's run on this computer for the last 30 days. Now, some of this goes back longer than 30 days. You've got energy usage where it required, uh, tells you how much battery time is being used and so forth. And you also have long-term battery usage here. So it's a very useful to tool with lots of great information that you can use to supplement your incident response um, information, or it can be the source of all your incident response information when you get to an organization that doesn't have logs. ESE to CSV is the command line version of this. So what ESE to CSV does is it does the same thing. It'll give us access to these databases that, um, that, and that are in there. Let me just show you this a little bit from the command line. So here's my ESE to CSV um, tool, ESE to CSV.exe. If I do it dash H, you can see that it gives me my help. I can list files that are on there. You can also acquire log uh, live files on this. I can recursively search through folders and things like that in order to find that file. So this is good for just forensics hunting expeditions. So let's just do this command here and take a look, see if I can find some ESE databases that are on my system. So here I, I can see that I've got this ESE database called QMGR, right? Under network download QMGR, and I did R, my command lines were R for recursively go through the hard drive and L to list the folders. And underneath that, I can see that there's a messages table, process table, and a delivery table. They're all empty though. Um, let's see, here I've got uh, a, another file. Let's, let's look at this SMS um, interceptor. Let me just take this entire path right here and let's just take a look at what's in this database. So I'm gonna use ESE to CSV and I'm gonna do a dash L to list the contents of that file. It reaches out to it and well, again, this is this one is empty here. Uh, what about that Q manager? Let's, let's go back and see if we can um, grab a copy of that. What was my path to that one again? All right, let's just grab a copy of this Q manager. It looks like that one actually did have some files in it, in its tables. ESE to CSV dash L. All right, here I can see it's got a couple of tables in it, one called job, one called files. If I wanna dump those files, what I can do is, if I just don't provide any arguments, um, then it's just gonna dump those files. And here, if I do a dir asterisk.csv or jobs, asterisk.csv, I can see there's a copy of that jobs. Um, and files.csv, 
there's that file where it's dumped both of those. If I put a dash A on here, it's going to acquire locked files. And if I do a dash P, I can give it plugins um, in order to have it process files. Now, the plugins that are available, let me just do a dash. Let's see. Let's do a CLS. Let's do a ESC to CSV. CSV dash L or dash P for dash plugins. Um, the plugins expect an argument. If you just give it dash P list, it'll tell you the names of the plugins that are available. Right now I have a Spartan plugin, which is used for processing ESE databases and an SRU DB plugin. Either of these can be used in order to dump files. I have an L to list the folders. Okay, so back to the PowerPoint presentation, just to show you a couple of quick command line argument examples. So here we're going to use ESC to CSV. We're going to tell it to use the SRU DB plugin. We're going to tell it to list the tables that are available inside of my SRUM database. And here you can see the names of all of the different tables that are available in my SRUM database. If I then decide to dump a specific table and this SRUM database is locked by the operating system, well, then I can use the dash A for acquire when I pass the command line arguments. So here I'm running ESC to CSV and telling it to acquire a locked copy of this and use the SRUM database plugin again uh, to process this file. If I don't pass it any other arguments other than acquire and use the SRUM dump, it dumps every single file that's in the database. So here when I do a DIR, you can see I got a different CSV for every table that existed inside of that SRUM database. If I wanted to dump a specific table, then what I could do is I could use the dash D argument. The dash D, I can give it the name of the table and it'll just dump that one table. Now, whenever you use the dash D argument, it expects your table names to be separated by spaces and the very last table name should be a dash dash, indicating you, you, you're done giving it the names of all the tables. So you put all of the names of the tables between dash D and the dash dash argument, and it'll go through and dump each of those files one at a time from the ESE database. And then you can pull these logs back centrally to your location and begin processing those as part of, of your incident. So the next time you're in an organization and they tell you, well, we don't have logs, or they show you their pitiful excuse for logs and you wish that you could just go back in time and grab all of that information up, and begin processing it, just remember that you've got copies of SRUM dump and ESE to CSV that you can use to pull that information historically. Again, that information is available on my GitHub. So if you go out to github.com, Mark Baggett, SRUM dump, you can download the latest copy of SRUM dump. And github.com, Mark Baggett, ESE dash analyst, you'll find a copy of ESE to CSV. Um, use these in your next instant response. Send me an email. Let me know how they're working for you. Once again, thank you for coming out to KringleCon. Thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of the conference.